But what happened was, is is immediately once the airport was on, they actually had two newspapers, but immediately once the airport had, had, had arrived and been checked after an analysis by scientists, it was placed in a container, a sealed container, glass case, and kept out of UV. What was interesting is that the degradation on the newspaper was rapid. And the scientists came back to look at the newspaper because it was browning so fast. They realized that from 1936 to 1998, that length of time, that was the effect on the newspaper browning. It happened so quickly though, it's like it caught up today. Welcome back. I'm here with Steve Mira. Steve, welcome. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for having me on. Interesting. I, I appreciate it. One of my previous guests is a big fan, and I think he's going to present at a conference that you're going to be at. I believe it's in Manchester. I believe it's in this month. Oh, uh, is he from the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you his name. It's Nathaniel Gillis. Yeah, Nathaniel, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that is good. He's only... <laughs> he's found his own way, his own path. But yeah. He- exactly where we are you know there are different methods of getting there and you can go through different routes you can go through the supernatural the occult ritualistic and all that sort of thing demonic or demonology but it all traces back to the same place if you follow that path so he's done exceptional work he's a great guy all right well he he, you're the reason that uh or he's the reason that you're you're here he'd be recommended i Cool. He didn't explicitly tell me to interview, but he's just like, he's a big fan. I'm like, I need to look, I need to look into Steve. Okay. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how you got into this area. You started on what's traditionally called paranormal, even though I would loop, you know, kind of include UFOs and in paranormal, but this is kind of traditionally paranormal when people report ghosts, poltergeists, apparitions, things like that. And it kind of led you on a journey that led you, for the most part, to to conclude that all of this stuff is related. But let's start with that part of the journey. How did this get started for you? Well, it started in 1983 for me. So we're in 40, just over 40 years into it now. And it's took that length of time because you can spend a lifetime in this subject and still not understand. You know, it's so vast. You couldn't complete it in a lifetime. And that's why it's so important to get information out so it gets carried on and the research continues. But for me, I'm interested in the paranormal because my grandmother lived in a house which was having paranormal phenomena. My aunts and uncles that lived there all experienced paranormal poltergeist type disturbance. So when I was very young, I was used to the terminology hauntings and ghosts and poltergeists and things like that. So it was just for me, it was kind of normal. But I did have an avid interest after leaving uh, school and stuff. So I did some research and I thought, okay, how do I get into this a little bit more? So, I And for the audience, just to be clear, you have an electrical engineering background, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I came from uh, telecommunications, electronics, electrical engineering, alarm security, all that sort of stuff. I was contracted to NATO for a while, in RAF Weathersfield in the UK. But I always had this interest. And uh, no matter what I did, I always kept coming back, coming back. Because for me, it's about the, what we understand about the world around us is far incomplete. And people can go through that life, you know, keeping their heads low and sticking to their routine and never be any the wiser. However, you know, I, I had to have answers. I needed, I, I can't settle with the word unknown because I want to know what the unknown is. Right. So I wondered to myself, well, what have I got to do to chip away at the unknown to make it known? And the only way to do that is scientifically approach it. Because I just don't get me wrong. I mean, I spent years doing the old routine of investigating properties where I'd just go out because it's a location where the disturbance is and see if I can gather data. This is the same thing that any ghost hunter sh- out there would do. Mm-hmm. Me though, it just you know it was sensationalized there was no data it was a wrong equipment lots of toys with wonderful flashing lights they look good but they're absolutely useless and that's usually what the case is and i needed more than that so i had to head into advanced studies of the paranormal and start treating it as 
lots of little subjects. So, for instance, how does it work? How does it tick? Is there a mechanism? And to do that, we adopted something referred to as power normal mechanics. And that's looking at the tiny, tiny little pieces of things to try and work out, you know, how does it get to the bigger picture? And that started getting very interesting because the more we started looking into and researching, conducting experiments in paranormal mechanics, we ended up with systematically same sort of responses throughout a lot of the investigations and experiments we've done. So there was a commonality and an intelligence. There's definitely intelligence, definitely a commonality there throughout all of them, which indicates, like in many cases, if we want to take, like, Poltergeist disturbances, though that they are rare, no matter how many times you'll see them on YouTube, they are extremely rare. And you start to kind of see this kind of a mechanism at play here. It's like a bit of a rule book to some degree. Like so there, fact, there are rules. It feels like this thing morphs anytime you can pin it down. Yeah, I mean, poltergeist phenomena, it's a progressive phenomena, it's a fear feeder, it's a parasitic phenomena, so it, it, it feeds on vexation, stress, you know, and that sort of thing. Usually targets individuals that are under already some form of stress or duress in usually environments where there's, you know, it could be financially difficulties, family difficulties, living conditions are poor. You know, it targets those individuals purposely because their vexation levels are already high. And if it sees somebody within those environments that is an adolescent, which are already high to chemical and biological changes taking place in the body, they are prime targets. And it's a bit like uh, I'm off to light. But I don't think that, you know, I mean, there are so many millions of people in those situations. But when you look statistically, it's so high that these people are targeted that there has to be a commonality there. There's got to be a reason. And when we look at that phenomenon, we realise that it is progressive. It starts off with audible disturbances, always audible disturbances, scratching, bangings, noises. And those things are, going, are purposely designed to generate some fear and generate lack of sleep deprivation. That's what he wants to do because it starts to weaken the individuals. And then it will continue to do that and add extras. There's about five different things it starts to add extra. Second thing, which is probably the most significant of all, is yeah, when it gets into this second stage, is object manipulation. Now, object manipulation covers lots of different things from objects moving, projectiles such as being thrown or thrusted through the air. It's also objects that turn up that don't belong to those individuals. Uh, usually that's done purposely to generate vexation. And it's stacking of objects, arranging of objects, our ports on the asportation, so it's the you know, it's the arrival and spontaneous disappearance. All those things come under the stage two of the object manipulation. And then it will progress, if it's long enough to do so, into what you might refer to as the apparitional stage. You know, now poltergeist phenomena, when we talk about apparitions, they tend to appear in association to what we might think they are. So, in other words, there's been cases where people think that, oh, well, this stuff might be Uncle Albert who passed away a couple of years ago. And it won't be long before the possibility of a, a sighting of, you know, an apparition of Uncle Albert is seen on occasion. And that's what this phenomenon can do. It's, it's so intelligent that it can manifest in, in certain ways. There was a young girl, actually, a young woman, should I say, and she, she was at school and she was due to leave and she disappeared. And it was a tell. It happened in Yorkshire in the UK, and the authorities were involved, the police, crime units. It was very unlikely for her to just disappear, and they conducted a thorough investigation, and she was gone for seven and a half months. Just after about three or four months, they concluded the police that you know there's there's a they have psychologists, police psychologists that come in and talk to the family. And I've done some work with the police and crime units, and this is a protocol that they deal with. They have to prepare the family for the worst, and they told the family there's a very high chance, and it's unlikely that A, she will return, and B, that there's the high likelihood of that something, you know, she came from to foul play. Of course, you can well imagine that the vexation level in those people living in the home, you know, the family thinking that the, the daughter, something happened to them, we're never going to see her again. And it's not the knowing that, you know, it's a, it's a problem because people... It's what you don't know. What you don't know is a problem. And that's mm -hmm. very, very difficult to live with and to consider that on an everyday basis. So they have to do that. They have to prepare the family for that. 
And after about three and a half months, they, it was reconfirmed to them that something definitely must have happened to the daughter because they started to see her apparition around the house. Numerous different members of the family, including audible disturbances. They thought she was trying to make contact with them. She's, at, she's not at rest, a soul, and all this sort of thing. They reached out to mediums. They reinforced it by saying, oh, yes, well, you know, I think she's on the other side. And she's trying to relay information to you. But she also wants to let you know that she's fine and she loves you. you The usual run of the mill. Now, this went on for some time. And surprisingly, after seven and a half months, she turned up. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. She actually run away with somebody who she loved. She says, oh, I wanted to marry him, I loved him. Very naive girl. But she did turn up because it all went foul and she got went back home seven and a half months later. And he throws straight away into question, well, what was the apparition? You know? Right, right. The apparition is the phenomena targeted the family because of the vexation, the stress, the upset. They were target, prime target. And it started to manifest into thought, thinking, this is our manifest in a way of what they're thinking. And if I do that, I'll create more stress and more upset. And I'll feed from that and generate the next act and so on and so forth. It goes. It's a vicious cycle. The, the, uh, it is the most resourceful phenomena in the world. Alter guys, you know, never wasted action. If they move something, they're going to make sure you think of it as being paranormal. I'm not going to move something in the kitchen and things. Oh, well, did I leave it there or did I put it there? Never that case. It's always so in your face. It's like, this, you know, I found my cup in, in the bath. I found my, my wallet disappeared and I found it in the fridge. You know, it's going to be stupid things where you know you've looked before, it wasn't there, or it's in a ridiculous place you'd never put it. And these are acts of purpose. And it's done purposeful because it wants you to recognise, oh, this is the phenomenon and get stressed and upset and all that about it. Because it wants to be from that to create the next phenomenon. And that's how it kind of works. But in this case, the apparition was, with, you know, that was nothing to do with that. the girl the girl was fine you know so it proves the resources of this phenomenon how they can generate things to create that vicious cycle of vexation and it works it plays us like a ball and of course going from there it can manifest even further into physical phenomena and that's when people get prodded pulled hit on occasion hair gets pulled scratch marks that sort of thing the physicality of the phenomena if it does go further than that, it starts to affect the psychological mind into oppression, depression. You know, you start to go in on yourself. You don't communicate properly with outside family. You don't tend to leave the home. And you start being, and this is when it starts to basically really attack. And it starts, goes from that section. It's very, very rare, but sometimes it goes from that area into the demological area, the three stages of demological, you know, which is like vocation and so on and so forth. And it leads to not a very nice place. They're very, very rare, those incidents. But there's a path through that, to that stage of that demological phenomena through the process of advanced poltergeist disturbances when it reaches that far so there's a progress he never just comes in at certain states it's always a pattern so there's a mechanism there's like a rule book and things and, I, and i've said to people because i ask questions you know and sometimes they don't answer me the way it should do and i know the phenomenon doesn't act in certain ways i know it certainly does in others but i know it doesn't in other ways and it's never been reported it's never been documented mm -hmm. uh, so i can look for those red herrings you know because that's what poltergeist phenomenon is. You can read it like a book. It always does the same thing. Sometimes they'll burn themselves out. In other words, I'm full up, I've had enough, and I'm gone. You know, and it just disappears and it fades away. 
impactful things and change in the environment and the family who have those experiences can also cause it to diminish because it's reliant on their stress and vexation. So one of the models, what we refer to as starving the phenomena, is going in and educating those experiences how mm -hmm. to react to the phenomena. Look, you know, it's, it's only designed to scare you and nothing more. That's all it was. Right. And when you eventually get keep at them and give them the process of a learning process of it's a protocol we have of how to deal with it. What happens over a period of time, they start to not be as vexed and stressed about incidents. Yeah, they're gonna happen, but just laugh at them and just say, Oh, get away. You know, don't focus right. on don't make it a big thing. They hate that. Oh they god, they hate it. And what happens is it just reinforced them because when you say, oh, well, you were having regular things maybe four or five times a day, and you started, the people living there start to recognize there's a suppression. Well, it didn't have nothing happened yesterday. Why do you think that? And then we go and say, why do you think that? We positively reinforce it and say, why do you not? Because you are directly affecting the phenomena. To advertise on Through Glass Darkly, Email thrillglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. And then it reinforces them even more to carry on. And eventually, we have been successful of ridding poltergeist infestations since so clicked through this process of starving the phenomenon. We're starving it from its food, what it needs to create. Fear, right. Exactly. So, you know, it's not always easy. Some people, you know, they watch too much television and Hollywood films and they're absolutely petrified. It very rarely ever happens like that. But they think he does. And they hear the worst stories, they watch the worst television programs on it, and they get themselves so hyped up about it. The phenomenon thinks, oh, I'm in a perfect location. And sometimes it doesn't work because you just can't get the family to accept, you know, that there's, there's a connection between you. You can't survive without you. It's a conduit, it's a pairing, you know. But others you can help if they, if, you know, if they can manage to deal with their own vexation and stress and stuff. So there's a progressive thing there. there's a mechanism and we can learn about it and we can see this uh, play out. There is a mechanism with the haunting phenomena because the haunting phenomena comes in two stages. You know, you've got your residual phenomena, which is like, I don't even think it's, we should even call it haunting when it's residual phenomena. It's, it's a natural earthly phenomena, which we don't understand, which has the capabilities of playing back events. Now, sometimes they're audible and visual. Sometimes they're just audible. Sometimes they're just visual. Sometimes they take place at anniversaries or locations of where there's a lot of trauma. I think when we're having battles or we're very frustrated psychologically, people who have committed suicide and stuff, when we see replays of events, there's always, emotional. always emotion involved. Now, it's not always bad because we get replays of events where you know, we could hear people enjoying themselves and laughing and stuff like that. But it's heightened emotion that gets captured into the geological aspects of the land and it gets played back. People might see that and go, oh, it's a haunting. It's not really a haunting. Is it? I consider a haunting when it's interactive or intelligent. In other words, it recognises you, it recognises the environment you're in, and it interacts in some way. And that is an interaction. Therefore, it can't be residual, it can't be a recorded event. So regarding these, let's call them, I don't know, memory hauntings, or, you know, it's, it's like the, what you're saying is the geology is kind of just recording the, the, incident. so two crazy ideas. I, you know, I'm not attached to these ideas at all. In these particular hauntings, have you looked at the geographic composition of the area? Is there a lot of like courts there? That's question one. Question two is, and this is more quantum mechanical, if, you know, we're all just vibrating light and sound, and that means, you know, just vibrating electrons, basically, at a certain frequency. Now, there is this notion that time is simultaneous, right? And, you know, imagine, again, I don't, I don't know, I'm a moron, I, I don't know if this, but imagine if at different times, if time is happening simultaneously, each time incident is at a slightly different frequency. So it's all happening all at once, just like a radio station, and you just shift the frequency. So an, an alternative possibility is, could these memory events simply be because they're highly energetic, right? So they have, you know, you're an engineer, have very high amplitude, right? And maybe they have a wider dispersion or bleed, you know, bleed through that 
people are just perceiving living people just at a different time well you know there are people that have said that they've experienced these type of disturbances or interacted and that's a whole different ball game that's oh yeah, we start yeah. Getting crossover regarding you know time displacements time anomalies sort of thing but that's a different research area okay and when it isn't you know what we've captured some belters over the years and we've got recordings of the second world war the planes the bomb sirens going off explosions at a time you know it was only what five years ago you know so it's it's, it's a but we were in a location which was a military location which was utilized during the second world war that's its footprint and these recordings were captured a castle Tutbury castle in in england there was an event that was re recorded which was the siege and the battle and the siege to take Tutbury castle and there was we got musket fire it was analyzed it was confirmed this is musket fire you've recorded it's a specific sound and frequency and we could hear people shouting and crying and panic and it was just all chaos all hell broke loose and we recorded it it's just in a normal silent environment you know it's um so these things do get do happen and i think what happens it doesn't happen all the time but i think occasionally if we look at it as the event geologically captured in the ground plays out like a cycle mm -hmm. and what happens us it doesn't happen to everybody it was certain people oscillate certain frequencies and there's a second and what happens is the pit reaches the peak and they cross over so you've got these areas sometimes where the bottom of the band frequency hits the top band of their frequency and there's a slight overlap and mm -hmm. what then is at that overlap area where we experience these things or are able to capture these things this definitely has a geological connection because we do know that yes you were right you're absolutely right sean about saying about you know quartz and we're also by the way that was i literally just guessed like that was that, that was just like right now <laughs> we're dealing with natural geological energies here in association though that the phenomenon I mean, we don't understand why is the phenomenon present <laughs> but we do understand where it's getting its battery power from and that can be sometimes quartz it can be sometimes granite buildings granite stones granite footings of buildings those sort of things and that happens a lot and what happens sometimes when you can tell it's the geology of the land is that sometimes you could have a particular area having that type of disturbance and then someone comes along the builder and starts building houses on them and the people in the houses start witnessing the, the phenomena it's because you capture it like a fly in the glass because the land, it, it, the phenomenon, geological phenomena, mm -hmm. uh, and that can happen, but it does rise from the land as well because we have phantom bombers in, in the UK. These are of bombers that flew into hillsides on cloudy, foggy nights, and we have a few places. One of the main ones is known as the Peak District, and Dakotas and all sorts of different aircrafts crash there and pilots and people were killed and his monuments there to show that you can actually go up there and still see wreckage of the aircraft you know from many years ago but just now and again people will experience seeing them as if they're going coming into blinds at a hill you know or seeing them and hear them sometimes they just hear them and they don't see them and so it does rise from the land you know it's not at ground level always sometimes it's you know it rises up above and that's got to he's got to be down to the geology of the land we know phenomena is suddenly peaked up because of natural quarrying that we've done and in general when we cut slabs out of hills when we're doing natural quarrying, the natural geological flow of energy suddenly it's a wall because there's nothing there to flow through anymore you might manifest as quarry lines like a bit like earth-like phenomena but also you'll get reports of incidents that are associated to the land so there's, a, there's definitely a geological connection but in other cases when they're interacting now that can't be a recorded event because they are interacting with you you know so you might see something like a, a horse-drawn carriage and the phenomena interacts with you in a certain way in your environment you know? now the big question that we've always asked is are you so we refer to we refer to as os factor type experiences here in the uk it's a nickname and it means have you temporarily left your reality and merged with theirs you know or is it interacting in our reality or are you aware you're interacting in their reality and you're not aware because you don't see anything but them 
it, it gets very, very complicated. And this is where science is at the moment. We're trying to work out what camp is this in. We've got the experience. Mm -hmm. Trying to dissect that is next to impossible because we're dealing with phenomena we just can't replicate. That's the problem. Now, going back to the poltergeist phenomena, <laughs> you talked a little bit about a ports. Now, Nathaniel mentioned this, and I want to dive deeper into it if, if right. I get this accurately. So, I think there's a mention of an experiment where you had a mug that disappeared and then came back and you analyzed the molecular composition. And he said something about different isotopes. Okay. Can, yes. Can you say more about can you say more about that? I want to make sure I under because absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Was, what happens in this incident is a favorite book. And it's usually something you'd recognize as notice. That's when, you know, when poltergeists take stuff, they'll take your keys, they'll take important paperwork, they'll take the wallet, they'll take the things that, oh, you're going to need these, I'm going to move it. Because if it's something it, you're not going to recognize or for a couple of days it's even missing, it's a wasted resource. They're, not, they're very resourceful. Right. You know, they wanna, you won't they, even notice. You won't even notice. You won't, like, oh, maybe I just misplaced it. I don't remember. They right. never do that. And in this case, it was Richard just on the side and somebody's having a tea and it just gone. Turned around, the mug's gone. You knew it was there. And eventually, at some later stage, it turned up. And when we were doing the investigation, we had to mark up, okay, because we, it looks the same as any other mug. The other, there was a set of four mugs, actually. It was purchased by the owner at Christmas, which is only three months prior to the investigation. So lucky for us, we could bench test it against a non-apported mug, you know? But yeah. if it was a swap, you'd never know the difference. I mean, we had to label it straight away just in case it accidentally gets mixed up because it weighs the same, it looks the same. It's, it, in context purposes, it is the same. There's no difference. Apart from, it, you know, apart from it being maybe 12 to 15 degrees warmer when it first arrived. So we decided because we had a test sample, a, a normal one, we asked if we could have them. <laughs> Do you mind? We'll pay you, buy you some more money. You know, right. oh, have them, you know. Um, so we took them off for analysis and we used Lancaster University to conduct the analysis. And it was microscopy analysis at the atomic level. I mean, this is really looking very close. And they took samples of the mug and they crush it up and it goes under the microscope and it gets checked. There were three different types of microscopy that took place on this on this mug. Now, what's very interesting is that the computer has a software in there to identify. So it looks at this sample, looks at that sample, and, and draws a comparison. So it's looked immediately at the normal mug, the non-apported mug, and it got all the details. This is what it's made of. You can see under the microscope it was it's gone through the ceramic burn. And so we look at the non-apported mug, computer details, all the things in there, right from the day it went through into the ceramic oven on day one when it was built, and the layering of the spraying, because it's done, it's not hand-painted, it's sprayed on the mug to get its colour, and then there's the glaze on top of that, and then the stamping on top, so it looks at everything. And he put all these statistics up, what the mug consisted of, da -da -da, these are the ratios, da -da -da. So then we give him the apported mug, it gets crushed up a little bit, some parts of it, and it goes the same process. And all that data on this side comes up of the apported mug. So the computer's looking at the normal mug, and it's looking at the apported mug, and it does a ratio check, and it go, it says, this sample is not that sample. In other words, if it had a tipping scale to say this was the same, it was the opposite. In other words, the, the computer recognised that that isn't even a mug. It wasn't even, it would not identify it as the same as this source. In other words, what the hell's going on, you know? So we thought, okay, so we'll let's, we need to know what is it that's changed then? What is it that the computer's looking at and going, why is it different so much? Vastly different. And what happened was he noted a diathermic alteration in the mug, literally at a cellular level, in a sense, at a microscopic level, it's like the whole thing had been remanufactured in some peculiar way. Even looking at the microscopic scans or images, it just did look nothing alike. And yet, you would never know that, that is an apported mug. You would have never known. So we thought, okay, so 
what was interesting is that when we got this report back we thought wow we can't even confirm it's the mugger left because just because we think it weighs the same and looks the same it is the same that might not be the case here because according to the computer data that appeared back you know the exported mug is so vastly different we have to consider it on the evidence rather than our eyesight we can hold it and see it but we know well that's not enough let's look at the data the data and the evidence says well no it isn't so we have to say okay well if it isn't as if one of two things have happened one it's gone so through a, such a severe alteration and i'm not just talking about just getting hold of a muck and applying something to it i'm talking broken down on a molecular level and something is something i can't say it's the same mug it's been re, re put together in a certain fashion to make us think it's the mug so what we used to do <laughs> so what we're kind of wow this is you know no, i'm not i'm not aware of anybody else at that time conducting analysis on apples it was a bit i mean surely somebody would have thought an apple you've got to you know you've got to at some stage analyze them <laughs> most people never did it was like oh well there's an right. apple it's really interesting and we got it and we yeah, oh wow yeah and that's it <laughs> and then you you know and then you put the apple back on the shelf and the phenomenon continues to take place so and that's been going on for years but we thought no well no 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 you know we, we, we're going to intrude into the phenomenon side now and start picking and power on my mechanics remember start picking and prodding as to what the hell is going on here how this has happened two things it's rather molecularly been put and created and then sent back to us in a sense or it's a mimic it was never the muck it's a pretend muck you know because mm -hmm. it might look like it and feel like it but it ain't it yeah <laughs> you know there's no data to say it's even the same thing so we, we've going following the data well follow the science so you'd say okay well it's not the muck it left therefore could it be a mimic so what we started doing through this process of analysis and investigation these experiments was when we were having incidents where these podcast infestations these airports were taking place the protocol that we wrote out for this was to test the theory was to remove the airport so we always said give us the airport we'll move it away because most of these people don't want experiences to continue so we're trying to diminish or suppress the activity so we started to take the airports away with us and what was really interesting, because what we used to get reports of, well, it's, it happens every day, this stuff, and I'm sick and tired of it, scaring everybody. To, and we'd say, okay, so let's take the apple away. There was a sudden suppression. And it was like nothing for two or three days. And then all of a sudden, it kick up again. Interestingly enough, the phenomena trapped the airports. So when we took the airports somewhere else, the phenomena trapped it. That's what it. yeah. Okay? And it was disturbances in the location. Where we, don't give, we don't take them home. Yeah. <laughs> were disturbances were on the airports where they were keeping them for a very short period of time maybe two or three days so what we seemingly have done here is confuse the phenomena and then we thought okay if that's the case are these airports purposeful it's not just about oh look at me and i'm going to scare you because you're going to know that this power all flow is taking place here by moving and doing this but it leaves a quantum anchor mm -hmm. in the house so then the phenomenon knows where to deliver the experiences, the disturbances. And when we took it away, it got confused and went in that direction. Only for a few days and it kind of figured it out and then it, we came back to the location. But this family were like, well, how do we suddenly have nothing for three days? And we realized by doing this over a number of years, there was a pattern. And that pattern might be that the app horse acts as a quantum anchor for the deliverance of disturbances to those locations but it's clever stuff this phenomenon it learns it learns in you know and eventually it figures out oh I, i'm not in the right though this isn't the right though and goes back to it has to do its homework again and figure out to get back and it usually does and it starts kind of again but it's that suppression that we were causing because of removing the airports that led us into thinking this is a quantum anchor type of phenomenon that's taking place here. It should be utilised, not just an app or, but a uh, an item. Now, the problem is, is that if you were out and the phenomenon wants to do an app or, you would never have known if it hadn't relocated it, would you? Right. You'd not 
No, he's just, oh, it's in them. I just get the mug out of the cupboard and have a cup of tea. You're drinking out of an apported mug and not even know. And it delivers the phenomena, you see. And that was a key thing for us. But we've also found, which is also very, very interesting, is that apports that can be measured against time shows unusual things, markers. For instance, let me give you an example. If I had a metal candlestick and it mm -hmm. had disappeared and it reappeared two hours later in another part of the building as an apport, we would not see any age degradation of it because it's just, you know, you could sit that candle on a shelf for 100 years and see no degradation of it, to be honest with you, in time. You know, this is 100 years, you pick it up, wipe it, it's the same, looks the same, feels the same. But things which are recognisable for dilations in time, you know, such as, for instance, in regard one experiment that took place in Norfolk yeah. as part of the store experiment, a newspaper reported mm -hmm. from 1936. The newspaper was analysed to hell by numerous scientists. It was 1936 in... It was 1936 paper, and they said, basically, it looks like it's just come straight off the print. It was like mint. And yet, it looked, it, everything... I mean, they still have it today? Oh, yes. But what happened was, it says immediately once the airport was obtained, they actually had two newspapers, but immediately once the airport had, had, had arrived and been checked after an analysis by scientists, it was placed in a container, a sealed container, glass case, and kept out of UV. But what was interesting is that the degradation on the newspaper was rapid. And the scientists came back to look at the newspaper because it was browning so fast. They realised that from 1936 to 1998, that length of time, that was the effect on the newspaper browning. It happened so quickly, though, it's like it caught up today very, very fast within you know, maybe a month or something, and then it was it was aging five hundred days per day, I reckon, approximately, till it until it had looked like normally a newspaper that you'd kept from nineteen thirty six, and it started browning. You know, and that's that was interesting because it wasn't kept in any form of UV or anything which damaged right. the newspaper. So they started to think, okay, so there's references here to the possibility of a time dilation. The once I started putting that information out, I ended up talking well people came to me and some people in high places can't mention names mm -hmm. and i got the same story from three or four individuals which didn't even know each other and i thought this is odd you know where are they hearing this and i can't confirm it at all i, I always say i cannot confirm it could just be here say but four individual non-related individuals came to me at, over a period of time after this information came out I said that there are certain experiments taking place within uh, facilities like CERN where they're trying to open a small hole in reality. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to find out what the biological, you know, what the biological sense of, of that would be to get into it and come out of it on a, micro, on a small scale. So they decided to utilize mice and put them in for only a few seconds and bring them out. Fortunately, the mice were all, this is the story I'm told, the mice were always dead as soon as they took them out. And they didn't know really why. Eventually, though, they realized that the mouse could survive if this, but only for a few seconds. They if were they, asleep. If they, no, no, if, there's, if, there's, mm -hmm. if the mouse was surrounded in argon gas. So they put it mouse into a container filled it up with argon gas and put it in for a few seconds. And when he retrieved it, it was still alive. But it only stayed alive for a couple of hours. And they thought, well, why did it die? You know, maybe the transition, maybe he died once we put him in, but why should it die when in our reality? And when he did checking, there was rapid age cell growth. He died of old age. Now, I don't know if that's true. I'll hold my hands up and say, look, what I can say is, Four people in high places, not related to each other, all knew the same story and all relayed this to me. And if that is true, if there's any element of that true, then we have to consider all the realities around us have a displacement in time. Which so kind of here's, here's something really creepy. So if that story is true, 
Stephen King wrote a short story about it in like the 1980s. It's called The Jaunt. And oh. it's it's about a technique where they they teleport people to Mars, okay? And they start with mice and he, like the story is all about about half the story is about all the experiments they did with mice. And they would send mice across and then alive and they would bring them back and they would always come back dead. And so they put them asleep. They didn't do the argon gas thing, but they put them asleep and then they would emerge on the other side just oh. fine. But the Stephen King aspect of the story, which is not really relevant to this discussion, is yeah. there's a family that goes there and there's a really rambunctious little boy and, <laughs> you know, who basically refuses to go asleep, to go to sleep. So he comes back. So when they come back, his hair is completely white and he, he uh -huh. just he says something like. You have no idea how long it was. You know, it's yeah. like, I was in there for so long, so long. It's just, I, I, those aren't the right words. The words work for the story a lot better. But it is my favorite Stephen King short story. But it was about this advanced, like this extreme. Yeah. When you made the transition, you were in this place for presumably a near infinite amount of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And you just, you know, the, the mice would just go crazy and then just die. Anyway. Yeah, I've heard there's lots of different references to this. There's, there's the purgatory documents, which is about, you know, analyzing the possibility of purgatory. There are people that have had near-death experiences and found themselves uh, in a dark place that seemed to be there forever. And then really, though, they were only gone for about a minute. <laughs> you know, there are people also who claim to have been taken, and abducted, or fairy encounters, caught inside the circle of fairy rings and stuff. And they, you know, they've been gone for days, and yet they were in there only for an hour. You know, incidents where people have allegedly been taken, abducted, and they've gone for days, and yet they were only about an hour. I mean, if you take Travis Walton, who's probably one of the most, you know, recognised individuals for those type of experiences. He was yeah, the tree growth, the tree growth of the area, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's definitely something actually happened there now. I was uh, an official spokesman to that particular documentary, Travis the Movie, and it was on a road trip with Travis all around America doing that. And we were followed by a UFO in the sky down the freeway. We stopped a few times, and this thing stopped, and I didn't follow. And I, I remember joking to Travis, saying, oh, oh, they're going to go for two for the price of one here. You know, and he like, <laughs> just laughed. You know. But when he asked the question, do you recount five days? I did no. An hour or something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Don't feel it. But, you know, he, he was gone for five days. You know, so uh, it's a possibility even those type of experiences might have some type of time anomaly associated with them. He pops up time and time again. The only thing I can say as a certainty is that the newspaper, absurdly aged that it shouldn't have done, and it just didn't make any sense at all. And that, that was to do with two newspapers did the same. You know, so it's interesting. Well, it's almost as like, I mean, if you take like a simple physical example of a gradient, it's just a, like a pressure valve, right? It'll equalize, the, that pressure flow will equalize, you know, from zero to whatever the pressure was. It could be some sort of normalization process as the flow of time, if you yeah, even think I, of time as a flow, right? Yeah, I mean, we don't know that. I mean, you know, we, when we when we had... We had 17 experiments conducted in what we might advance parapsychological experiments. Three of them have been released to the general public. The fourth one is about to be released maybe the next month. They have to wait for markers. They call them markers. They wait for certain things to happen in regarding human consciousness, about the phenomena, terminology changes, people recognize something new. These are what we ref they refer to as markers, and they have to wait for them to put out information because people have to digest it slowly. You can't just drop it all on people's laps because it's you go crazy with it. You really would. But the experiments that we ended up, we ended up, don't get me wrong, I mean, we had all the paranormal stuff, you know, communications with things that told us that they were once human. Some of them, that the detail that we got were recorded and analysed and researched to show that these people never even existed that they never worked where they said they worked, that their names never were nothing, you know. So it was a whole deceptive thing there involved. Deception runs through this very, very highly. 
Um, but within all deception areas, with all information, there's this disinformation. It's just like the internet, really, I suppose. Right. Um, but, but there are there are some good stuff in there. It's mixed in with factual things, I believe. And we communicated with numerous different things. Some of them were telling us about specific questions because we got to the point where it, it was direct voice phenomena. It takes a long time to build up this procedure. It takes a long time, like eight and a half months of constant work just to get to that level and then you've got to sustain it so in other words when you've got because when we have a, these experiments there are certain people involved in it everybody's got to gel in, in a psychological and even frequency way in a sense of speaking because it could be it's like mediumship you know when you might have a seance with six people around but it works better when there's the right people involved you know you might have one there and you think no we've got to change this person and then you find out Eventually, you get to a point where, oh, look at the responses we got with utilising this, you know, and eventually we realise, okay, well, don't change that. Let's keep that now. We work that. That's just, these are the right people. Let's put, carry on. And you build up this conduit with this source to the point where you could walk in there any day of the week and within five minutes, you've got an open communication. We'd received that. We got to that point through eight and a half months of work constantly every day to get to that point when we got to that point we started to get communications and some of those were things it, it kind of manifested as direct voice from our dvp it's always above us for some reason if you sat down it's above you if you stand up it's above you <laughs> always above you the sound comes and it got to the point where they they could say we want to ask some questions can we ask some questions and get uh, some answers and it was designed, you know, it was set up basically, okay, well, on Thursday, which is a couple of days away, we can come with our 10 questions, for an example. And they would try their best to answer them. Okay, I thought, oh, I'm a bit dubious, but nevertheless. But it was quite funny, Sean, because I've always been asked many years, you know, oh, if you could ask some questions, what would you ask? And I could just reel them out. Oh, easy, I'd ask this. I'd ask this. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't stop. <laughs> I wouldn't stop, yeah, at any other time. But because I've been involved in this eight and a half month research experiment just to get to that stage and realizing the realism of getting an answer i was like <laughs> do i want to know <laughs> do i really want to know i mean how many how's this going to affect my life my reasoning my thoughts my you know beliefs and, and i thought oh i was then i started to be really choosy about the questions because at any other time i would just be in the mouth. I remember, was, you know, there was a few of those questions, and they were very interesting, you know, because this was going back many years ago, and some of those questions about dimensions around us. Well, they were apparently, according to them, they're, they're all around us all the time. It's phenomenal right. around us. We're just so disconnected because of our limitations, of, you know, but they aren't, but we are. And we were told oh, there's 11, there's 11 dimensions. And this is, and I looked around and our it's whole- It's like string theory, right? There are 11 well, dimensions of string theory. Today. Well, this is years back. We looked around everywhere. Yeah. We couldn't find any details, any information about 11 dimensions. Yeah. And now it's all over the place. It's like, whoa, you know, I mean, the scientists are saying there's 11 dimensions, and yet they must have been not even doing the research at the time we, we were told this stuff. So we documented it. Okay, stamp file it, document it. Okay, there we got it. Let's see what happens. wonder if anything in the future might come up and say 11 dimensions. Well, it did. And that surprised us. And we thought, okay, so in that, nuggets of information there's some, some good bits other but, way other but, things not but by but by dimensions you don't necessarily mean like 11 discrete realities you mean like 11 physical dimensions 11 physical dimensions w yes. which, of which we see now, three when we start asking about realities there are multiple apparently there's like multiples of me and multiples of you and you know there's multiples according to, but then is that a bit Right, right. It's like the double slit experiment, right? Like if, if the electron had gone to the other side of the screen and then that's just multiplied, you know, all the way up the scale and that's how you get this Hugh Everett's multiverse theory, right? The problem is that when we when it's all things that we can't prove, we can't do nothing with it. We can only, you know, I mean, and then we start to think, well, why are we even asking these questions? Because they could tell us 10 lines, we'd not know, would we? Right. Well, you did know. anyone in the room have any? Well, the 11 thing is probably out of the blue, right? Nobody would think 11 physical dimensions, or was there? 
somebody in the room. Nobody knew anything about Lennon. This is years back before any documentation that came out that we could find in regarding left dimensions. And then some years later, it started appearing, and then other people, some other scientists started saying it. And now it's a kind of common thought now in regarding some of these results and experiments that they've done that there's 11 you know, these dimensions. That Is there the a chance that we're generating some aspect of the phenomena? I don't know. We didn't ask those questions, didn't get to that. I mean, we're very selective. We've only asked 10 questions. We're going to really be choosing. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. We really started getting interested because we wanted to do it again. And they said, well, no. <laughs> and we said, well, can we, you know, I mean, and we pressed it. And we'd always ask this during the sittings, we'd always ask, can we ask another 10 questions? And it was always there. And eventually one day we were said, yes, there was a yes. Okay. Well, oh, so we can ask more questions. So, so can we go and ask another 10 so questions? And would you give us the answers? And um, said, yes. Okay. Oh, right. Second round then. I thought, great, let's go on. Because you can't help being excited about it. It's interesting. Well, they said yes for a reason. And the, the reason was because they wanted to demonstrate something to us. And that, sent our heads into a bit of a tailspin. But it made sense. We decided to put 10 questions down and we came to the session. We said, we've got these 10 questions. Can we ask them? How oh, said, you know, ask your question. It was just ask your question. That's what it was. Okay, well, we'll ask the questions. And I was there with these other guys. We're just about to ask the first question of 10 and everything went, there was a very funny pressure in the room, like a pressure in your ears, like if you have an aircraft and something. And then it went out of the air. We couldn't say where it went because it was bellowed. This was right loud. It was like boom, 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 boom. Every answer. Ten answers. Just like that. And we hadn't even asked the question. How we even asked the question? Did, did you know what the question was? <laughs> We went back, we had to go and have a cup of tea and have a chat about that afterwards because we were like, what has just happened? Well, then we started thinking, hang on a second, and just hold on your horses. If they're obtaining it from the sitters, how can we trust anything that we're asking them? You look at mediumship, you know, we go in there and you say, oh, oh I'm picking up your grandma. The medium can't help it, who have getting the information. And the person there is going, well, the medium must be right. She knows because... Is only I know this about my grandmother. Eh, that's not true. It all knows about your grandmother because it's getting it from you. And it just relays information back and confirms it's real. I want to get more involved. There's the hook. It gets under the skin. And that's what it does with this, with this phenomenon. And, and we realize, wow, now I understand why the parapsychological departments of the world will not confirm the evidence of afterlife. Because what they will confirm at a press, if you push them, yes, they're very intelligences. Yes, they communicate, but they are aware of deception. And they only got to have just one uh, evidence, a piece of deception, and we do have many. We have to rule it out. That isn't evidence. You might think you're talking to a grandma, but how do we prove it? They might appear to be. But how do we prove it? And therefore, the whole area of proving, and this is one of the main things in power psychology was trying to prove afterlife, it's just dropped out. It's just a total waste of study. Because mm -hmm. now we know that they are aware of what we want, our actions, uh, our interpretations, our knowledge, and it can manipulate and utilise it against us. And that's false evidence. So well, they also, that, It well, also appears to know the future, in a sense. It does. We did our experiments. We, we got told several times about events that are going to take place, and we documented a few of these, and they were absolutely, even to the point where it involved ourselves, you know, we're going to be in some strange place in, in 18 months' time, and we, we have no plans to be in, it's in another country, we no plans to be there, no idea why we'd even be there. But absolutely bang on to the day. And it's just the, the, I don't know if they created the circumstances to foretell what the event was, or they foresee the event, or the notes coming. I just don't know. Did he change reality and manipulate it for us to follow that path of what they've said? Or, you know, that is the, the forged path, and they know. I mean, it starts getting, 
it starts getting very problematic, as you can well imagine. But we do know that, you know, through the experiments, when we're looking at poltergeist infestations, and there's been many a times when, uh, I'll give you a typical scenario. I was investigating a poltergeist disturbance as we were interviewing a, a woman who was very upset. She was crying and she was all upset and she didn't know how to deal with this phenomenon. We were at her home and we were interviewing and we sat on a settee and we're talking to her, interviewing myself and two other colleagues. And as we were looking at her, because we're all making good eye contact, I turned my head because I thought something, I saw something move on a chair just to the right of us across the way. I immediately noticed that I'm not the only one looking over there. The other two investigators are looking over there. So something drew their eyes. So it wasn't just me. On the chair was a cushion. And I thought, did it just move? And it caught my eye. It was out of sight. But I sure saw something. And of course, I turned. And I'm looking at it. It wasn't moving. But I'm looking at the other. And I asked, why are you looking over? And we, saw, we thought we saw something move. And I thought, okay, well, maybe it did move. Or is it playing with our minds? Anyway, we watched it and watched it and we took some measurements and stuff and thought maybe we, it didn't happen. And we were, we were really in it. We didn't want to break up the interview process too much because it causes problems when you. So we just want to get back to the interview. We'll look at it afterwards and find out. And as soon as we all focused back on the witness, this thing, a cushion off that chair, that very cushion, flung itself across the room. It hit the, the shelf on the other side of the room, knocking over a picture frame. And uh, she was like, oh, screaming. And, oh, I said, okay, all right, calm down. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Show it off. I make light of it. You show it off because we were here, you know. But it was just designed to upset her because for her, it was like, oh, my God, this thing will even do it while we're here. And that puts her into a very insecure situation, more stress, more upset. Very clever, these things are. They're, they're very smart. <laughs> but we were on a step ahead of them. But we realized that the plausibility of it not moving, because we started, we started looking, I mean, really looking into cases where do people actually ever see them just a projectile? I'm not, about, I'm not on about a small thing that moves across the surface. Love that, like that wonderful scene from the Steven Spielberg film, Poltergeist, when the power psychologist is sat at the table in the morning with the family and she sits there and she says, well, your house isn't haunted. And then her cup of tea just slides right across the table and she looks very embarrassed. And she says, well, actually, it, it's, you're not haunted, but it's a poltergeist. You know, I just, that scene just makes it, you know, not on about just things moving. I'm on about a projectile, which takes a tremendous amount of force because mm -hmm. it flung itself so hard. It's a lot of energy. It wasn't moving when we looked at it. Maybe if we carried on looking at it, it would never have moved. What if we're quantum locking it it can't move until we take our eyes off it because then, like the double slit experiment, we changes and we release it from our observation and therefore the act can take place. I started to look into that. I started thinking, okay, well, again, we're getting into this quantum stuff again. And I thought, you know, it's the more you study this, the more you end up sort of going in, in that area, you know. Mm -hmm. So we started getting all these bits in the, in the research of paranormal mechanics. It was crazy. We ended up to the point, and this is going to be in the new document that's going to be coming out probably next month, the next one, you know, the fourth experiment, is that we got to a point where we had a vase on the table and there were flowers in it. And we were asking them to see if they would move the flowers. They have, you know, they've done that. They've, you know, we, there were in incidents where they did move the flowers around, you know. <laughs> And we kind of say, oh, thank you, sort of thing. But there was a low, uh, on one particular occasion, which we were, none of us, none of the experimenters expe expected this. The vase moved about, maybe it just slid, you could hear it slide across the table, it's physical, shh, and moved about four inches, four or five inches to the right. And we asked if it could do it again. It didn't, but the reply was to remove the flowers and put it back where it was. So I'm thinking, oh, great, it's good. they are going to do it again. So we took the flowers out, we moved it five inches back to its point of rest. And uh, we're all looking at it, thinking, okay, move, move again. Got the cameras around, move, move, move. And of course, they don't like it sometimes being recorded. They get a bit iffy dee, fiddy dee. You know, they just, sometimes they will do. So most times they won't, you know, because they don't like you holding all everything in the basket. They don't want you to have all the information. Mm -hmm. 
There's been plenty of times when we've asked questions and they'll say, we can't tell you that, but we won't tell you that, you know? And sometimes they just totally ignore us. And that's the end of the session. So sometimes we press it. We know, you know, how far to press before they close the door. So anyway, this vase, we put the vase back more, waiting for it to move. And we heard a, the voice come out saying to move it back ourselves. Of course, we went to move the vase over and you couldn't even feel the vase. It was like a hologram. The vase, we could see the vase. It was a glass, not crystal, but it was cut glass. And we could see there's a vase there, but you can't physically feel the vase. It didn't exist. It wasn't there physically. And there were no tingling sensations as you put your hand through it. There were no cold sensations. There was absolutely nothing. Measuring with equipment, zero. No EMF, no GMF, no negative ions, no radiation, no heat trace, no infrasounds or sonic waves, nothing. Not, absolute nothing. And yet, we could see this vase and yet we couldn't grab the damn thing. And that was like, what? and we're all giggling and laughing because we're all quite, I mean, okay, we're scientists, but it's fun at the end of the day. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what, demonstrate. And then they said, Try again, and we did, and it was back. It was like, oh, it's physical. We could pick it up. We took measurements on it. Nothing unusual about that whatsoever. And there are things like that happened before in in the skull experiment. The, the, the whole sitters, including the chairs, including the table, were relocated to the other side of the room. None of them had a clue at all what had happened. It was a demonstration. And when they pressed for an answer, they they were told, and I don't know how true this is because there's always deception involved sometimes. It might be true. But what they said was, we create a blueprint in our reality. And whatever we create affects your reality. Therefore, your transition from, the, from one side of the room to the other side of the room, including the chairs you were on, including the tables and the items on the table, was instantaneous no recognition no feeling of anything no noticing anything it just happened and when they were told to put the you know to put the lights back on they all realized they're in the other side of the room nobody had experienced any movement anything unusual and it was probably done as a demonstration but the physicality they would be like to demonstrate physicality the metaphysical aspects of what they can do they can bend alter change you know, our reality is just confined compared to theirs and their aspects of it because they, there's been manifestations of balls of light. And they're, they're a bit smaller than a tennis ball, about so big. And they come in various colours. Some are like a bluey white, some are white, and some are orangey white. Uh, the variations, slightly different sizes, but most of them are around about this big. And they'll appear... And they are physical because when they come over to your hand and you ask them, you don't have to physically ask. You can just ask it through your mind and they'll react in somehow as if they know what you want them to do. We'll come over and land in your hand and you can feel mass. You can feel weight. There's some weight and mass to it. And you can hold it like this and it shines out of your hands, you know, and then you can let it go and it starts to move around. It's intelligently in some cases. Some of them was, were thinking, come and touch me on my finger, come and touch me on my finger, and they'd come over and just, boop, just touch on the finger and bounce away. And they could feel it. But sometimes what they would do is they'd go onto the table in front of us, they'd bounce, they'd go boom, 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 and then the fourth one would go through the table, up through the table, through the table, up through the table, and they'd go boom, boom, boom. They were done purposely to show us that they can manipulate the physics. It's metaphysical mm. phenomena that they possess. One minute, what they wanted to prove to us and show us in this demonstration is that we can be physical or we not physical in your world. One of the two. Same as UFO phenomena, same as a, a paranormal phenomena. Paranormal phenomena can be good hit, you can be physical, but next minute it's you know it's something different. And it's the same with the UFO phenomena. So it's just like demonstrating. Well, let's let's stop here and then we'll start the next episode in the UFO phenomena. Thank you very much, Steve. This is fascinating. It's hard to stop you because it's so <laughs> fascinating. All right. Talk soon. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe. And also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel, 
and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.